Hello and welcome into Talk of the Town here on Channel 57. I'm your host, Rich Reynolds. Glad that you can join us today. As always, lots and lots of topics to cover. And I always like talking about fun stuff too, like when we bring in musicians, which is always a good time here on the show. So we have Kirk Stone and Lou Baroni. They are with Stone Barone and the Mad, or not the, and the, it's Stone Barone Mad Tones. Just for the website, but it is Stone Barone and the Mad Tones. It is. Okay. Yep. All right. So there, there we got it. Okay. Stone Barone and the Mad Tones. Got it right. I'm, I'm glad. So that's a little confusion there on my part. I apologize. <laughs> what I don't want to be confused about is your band. Tell us a little bit about it. How did you guys get formed up? How did that all happen? Uh, well, it's going on in about two years right now. Uh, me and Kirk were in another band before this, and um, that didn't really seem to work out. We weren't really doing musically what we really wanted to do. So uh, we formed this band. Uh, we had a lot of ideas as far as what we wanted to do, which was we wanted to c create a, a band that was going to be um, fun, uplifting, danceable music, and we wanted to incorporate horns. Um, at the time, I was working with a, another gentleman who was not in the band anymore that moved away that was a tuba player. And we had kind of an idea of like a root style band like on Jimmy Kimmel that we wanted to incorporate like a tuba and some really um, different instruments. And we wanted to get a sound that was gonna be I don't know, kind of unique, uh, fun, and actually do a lot of music that we were really passionate about. So. Um, it all kind of came together pretty quick. So would, is it like a pop sound, a rock sound? Uh, what kind of sound do you guys You know, I, I, I have this conversation with Kirk all the time because yeah. it's kind of funny because, you know, most of the time it's, it's, it's all different kinds of music that we really like ourselves as musicians. So um, it's, a, it's a different mix, honestly. It's a lot of funk. It's a lot of it's blues. It's a lot of, like, pop. So, yeah. R&B, soul. Yeah. Originals okay. that define. Yep. So. Okay, so like a lot of people, I know, I know myself, I got a pretty eclectic mix, you know, and stuff or eclectic. like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, very much so. Very Love much it. So. Okay. Yeah. Uh, heard that you guys have like a contest going on for a song submission too, right? What's that all we about? We do. So one of the things we've been working on is original music, and Lou and I are pretty adept at uh, defining the themes pretty quickly and creating new music. And what we want to offer to the community is the opportunity to create their own song. So uh, from the month of June, from June through the end of June, June first to the end, they're going to submit why they want a song, why do you deserve a song. So it's either a ballad or an up-tempo tune. They're gonna to write to the band and say, I'm in love with this person and I need a love song, or I hate my boss and I need an up-tempo <laughs> tune to tell him. And so, and then we're gonna choose that song and then during July and August, we're gonna create that song and then we're gonna announce the winner and that's gonna be the, their original tune to do with as they wish. Very cool, sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Um, talk about two, uh, you know, every band tries to target an audience. Uh, what's your demo, who are you going after uh, and, and where do you guys play? Well, um, we've been getting a lot more gigs this summer uh, in our second year or so, um, we really try to do this year the summer we've got a lot of gigs booked um, kind of outdoor uh, venues that kind of thing festivals what we really like to do is corporate events and actually do a lot of weddings so mm -hmm. um, people that could pay for like a DJ at like you know $1,800 to $1,600 they could get a band and we would do a song for them at an extra charge and I think um, that's really what we want to go after it's it's a lot of fun and it's gonna be like a lot of um, danceable stuff so yeah, I think it's kind of cool, too. I, I think the, the wedding or an event is always kind of upgraded when you have a band, too, isn't it? Yeah, 10-person yeah. Ten, ten band. So. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. Exactly. so it's 10 people in the band, so it's, it's, I think it's going to be a, um, it's a, a very fun time to, to like bring a band in that, that we can do the things that I think that we can do. Yeah, very cool. So you're looking to do more originals, uh, I'm, I'm hearing too. Talk about like some of the songwriting structure stuff you guys do. So one of the things that we did was we actually sat down uh, with a woman who was missing her father, and someone that Lou knows quite well, and she was very close to her father, and we created the idea of you tell us about your father, key phrases, ideas that are, are pertinent to the, the message of what you want to put out about this person. And from that we created the lyrics, and Lou and I sat down and did the thematic structure and the beat and rhythm and then the band is very good at coming in behind us and okay now this is horns and this is going to be where the guitar puts in and usually we can knock out a song almost soup to nuts in about a week. Wow, that's really impressive. Some guys like to do the music first, then the lyrics. Some guys will do lyrics first, then the music to fit it. Which one is, is better for you? Is it both? Uh, I, he is the lyrical genius, so. Oh. <laughs> he comes oh, up with well. it. He's, he's pretty, pretty amazing with that. Thanks. So I, I have no uh, issues with him doing all the lyrics. Um, we come up with the ideas or, you know, kind of like what the theme's going to be, and then he just goes to town with that. And then the music, I think, kind of comes from me or we'll collaborate, but I get a lot of the song ideas about what the song 
should really generally sound like, if it's going to be kind of like an upbeat song, that kind of thing, or if it's going to be more of like a jazz tune, or if it's going to be more, you know, that kind of thing. Excellent stuff. Fellas, thank you for being here. Check them out online for upcoming gigs. We'll have more Talk of the Town right after this on Channel 57. And welcome back, and a familiar face joining us here on Talk of the Town right now as with Wild, Irvin Carpenter is here, although uh, the thing that's unfamiliar is you're usually not solo. Usually you got Jessica with you. And, yes. Uh, graciously uh, has a day off today. Huh? Yes, Jessica is having a wonderful day off. Good today. for her. So uh, we'll talk to you then, and I'm sure that we'll do just fine without her, though. I'm sure everyone will miss Jessica a little bit. So uh, so talk to us a little bit, um, and, and everything that we've talked about in the past, we've talked about learning disabilities and how you guys, you know, and help and teach them, but especially um, dyslexia. And so, you know, if you could, um, give us like a simple definition, if you will, of dyslexia. The, the simple definition of dyslexia is two Greek terms put together to explain um, someone who has average or above average intelligence, but just for some reason can't learn to read and spell, do mathematics. Um, so the simple definition is uh, dis, meaning difficulty, lexia, meaning learning or reading. So it's difficulty with learning. I think most people have the assumption or just think like dyslexia means that if I see a number as 901, you see it as 109. That's not <laughs> what it means? <laughs> well, it's, um, it's not a visual thing. Okay. It is uh, a processing. So uh, as a dyslexic, I see everything the same way you do. It's just that when I process it in spelling or in reading, it'll sometimes come out reversed. Okay. I, I think a lot of people, too, might, might be confused. How many people, you know, approximately in the United States might have dyslexia? Well, about 20%. Oh, wow. One yeah, in five. One in five. Wow. Um, are, and, those are only, uh, and those are diagnosed. Okay. So we have a, a, a set of baby boomers. Uh, from 1946 to 1964 that were never identified. Hmm. So we have a lot of people out there that struggle with learning. Yeah, and I think that a lot of the corrective way to like deal with it, if you know, if, if they couldn't read, write, or you know, they, they didn't quite understand it, if they were in Catholic school with the nuns, would be a whack on the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Hey, hey read better. It. Wham. I've um, heard those stories. <laughs> yeah. So a, a lot of people might not know this too. Um, Irvin, you're dyslexic. I am. Um, so it, if you could talk about it a little bit, because you grew up in that baby boomer time then. Um, yes. So what was it like growing up with with dyslexia? Well, I was born in 1949. So uh, by the time I hit school, um, and uh, I had to spend two years in first grade because I just wasn't catching on to the reading spelling thing. And so they, they held me back. And um, so as I grew and went through the Madison School District, um, I just had a horrible time learning. And back then, of course, they had corporal punishment. So right, yeah. you know, I got spanked quite a few times for just being I, I, I joked about it, but, you know, I mean, seriously, <laughs> yeah. that's how it was. It was. Yeah. It was. And, the, and they, they saw me as being obstinate, not trying, um, you know, lazy. Those were the things that they told my parents. My parents believed it, of course. Right. You know, everybody can learn to read. Why don't you? Um, why don't you try harder? And <laughs> so as, as I went through school, it was, it was a horror for me. Um, I dropped out at age 16, which back then you could in 1966 is when I dropped out. Um, and I left home and I lived on, on, my, on my own for a year before I went into the military at age 17. Um, but I, I, I had spent my life up till mm, I was 32 years old when I finally went to the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh after I retired from the military. And there I found that I worked really, really hard to fail again, once again, in, in that institution. Hmm. So my, uh, my DVR counselor, or my, my VA counselor, um, suggested that I worked so hard to fail, maybe I had a learning disability. Now that was the first time I've heard that. Right. So he sent me for testing with Dr. Glika at UW Oshkosh. And two weeks later I found out I did have a learning disability and that I wasn't reading um, above the third grade level. So to be in college, being an adult, 32 years old, not being able to read or spell, you could imagine how I felt. Yeah. But there was a, a program at that university. I was lucky. They sent me to Dr. Robert T. Nash, and he told me that I had dyslexia, and he said, I can teach you how to read. 
but I'm going to teach you a different way. Instead of whole language, I'm going to teach you uh, phonemic awareness, and I'm going to teach you how to take the sound structure of our language and put it into reading and spelling. And, like, and this is something I'm sure that you can find out more about at yes. Wild, and hopefully you don't have to go through that same kind of frustration and stuff that you went through. So, Irv, Absolutely. That's a, that's a great story. Thank you so much you uh, for being here. We'll have more right after this. And we're back on Talk of the Town as Marianne Garidi from Moving Forward Madison is joining us once again. And hello, Marianne. Hi, how are you? Yeah, she brought some props with her as well. I love when she brings the props, although these props, I almost feel like I should bid $1.49 on the pasta barilla <laughs> there. <That's> <laughs> Maybe, right? See if I can win a exactly, car on, exactly. uh, on the Price is Right. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll get to all that as we as we chat with Marianne. And Marianne, um, we've been talking before about what a senior move manager is. So if you can again tell us, refresh our memories sure. a little bit, if you will. What's a senior move manager? Sure, absolutely. So a senior move manager is basically somebody who's trained through the National Association of Senior Move Managers, and that means it's just um, there's about a thousand of us around the country, and we're all basically trained under an umbrella of codes and code and ethics that we all follow. And that comes in handy when I'm moving somebody, for example, from here to California. Then when I need somebody to help them unpack and get settled in, in their new home, I can reach out to another move manager in that community so that we, we keep the whole move real smooth. So yeah, it's amazing. Well. There's a thousand uh, of you, right? Exactly, yeah. yes. And well. we all, we're all you know, separate businesses, and we all do things a little bit differently, but we know we all have that same common theme. So OK. Why would someone need a senior move manager? How does the whole process begin? Sure. So basically, you know, lots of times we're actually called by marketing directors of independent com communities or assisted livings, and they have a family who's visiting who, you know, they're ready to take the next step. And but they what's keeping them is the house and all the belongings in their house. So typically the marketing director um, will call, you know, call on us to kind of go and talk to the family and, and help them through all these steps you know, involved in moving. So then they can then, then finish the, you know, all the steps and be able to move into their new apartment. So we I kind of think, do all the loose ends. Yeah, I would think some of it is that you get to at least take some of the emotion out of it. I think with a lot of the items that people don't want to part with, there's some sentimental value, isn't there? Yes, definitely. We kind of go through them with, with you know, one-on-one -on -one lots of times and, you know, encourage them to keep some things and other things just try to part with a little bit. Absolutely. So how about this month? What's the uh, special event that you're working on? Sure. So basically, month? I brought my little grocery bag here. All right. So, um, <laughs> so part of NASM. We do, it's called Move for Hunger, is a national program that we do. And what we do is as people are moving, you can imagine, you know, they're not going to be cooking all, a lot of meals any longer. And so they'll have food to donate. And so what we do as move managers is we'll collect the food and then give them then to a local food pantry. And so here in Madison, um, I, you know, I did reach out to the River Food Pantry. So any extra food that I could deliver to them on behalf of my clients is, you know, a great, a great um parts of the whole moving process to make that go smoothly so you're not just, you know, wasting food. So I'm guessing it's dry, non-perishable food items. Exactly. Correct? Okay. Yes, exactly. All right. Not like pre-made lasagnas coming No, out not of the usually. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so. um, it, it, if you could share with uh, everybody too, you know, everybody will, um, I don't know if they're going to show up on that show hoarders, but a lot of people will hoard things. Um, if, if you could share with us like a downsizing tip or two that we can use. Oh, sure. Absolutely. And what I like to do is like that 80-20 rule. And so basically, if you kind of look at your own homes and um, it's really interesting, but about 80% of the things we own, we really don't need or love. So we kind of encourage people to start there if they're having a really hard time parting with things. So just kind of start in one room and say, okay, this stuff I could definitely live without. I'm not attached to it. I don't have that emotional value. And you just start decluttering. And then what happens is you see an empty closet and it's like the best feeling because you've seen your accomplishment and you feel good because you've donated items to you know, people who need them. And then you kind of keep, you keep moving on from there. So you just kind of start out small kind of just remember that you really don't need 80% of the stuff you have in your house and just kind of work from there. Yeah, my wife has been thinking about doing it because she keeps watching that tiny house hunter show. Yes. And I'm like, we're never going to get to that point. <laughs> Downsizing is one thing. Living in a tiny house is something uh, completely it different. It is. It's, it's yeah. tricky, but yes. A so. Absolutely. So so people got to do do the moving. You say a lot of times it's independent uh, independent living yes. uh, places that will call you, contact you, get the ball rolling. Correct. Who else will usually contact you? Is it, is it usually the person moving? Is it their their children? Who else might, might sure. contact you? And the children call us a lot because lots of times, you know, again, the children might be living in another state or they're working full time and um, to kind of if you can imagine decluttering a house of 3,000 square feet it's a lot of time and so lots of families just don't have the time that it requires to efficiently you know um, sell or donate the items plus pack up what the their parents want to bring so lots of times our kids will the kids of the seniors will call us in to kind of help again make it a smooth move and, and then we take away a lot of the stress also you know from the kids and the senior then 
who is moving. Yeah, again, I would imagine like so much sentimental, you know, stuff is just rolled up into that. I know we can't part with this and don't want to, you know, do away with that. Right. So, so yeah. great stuff. Yeah, and then in the end, you know, we often hear once they move into an independent community is they really wish they would have done it sooner. So what really holds them back is all this stuff. It's not that the fact that they, they don't want to move, it's just they just don't know where to start. Absolutely. So we're really good at kind of filling that gap as well. Marianne, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. You bet, and we'll have more Talk of the Town right after this. And back on Talk of the Town, and I think it's the first time in the history of me, at least, hosting the show that both of our guests have alliterative names. We have Angela Ackley, Carrie Kane, both, I guess, alliteration, right? <laughs> and <laughs> as we bring them in from Shelter from the Storms Ministry. So, uh, yeah, welcome on in. And if you could, I know you've been on our station before and even on this show. Remind everybody, if you could, uh, Shelter from the Storm Ministry, what, what is that exactly? Sure. Um, so we are a ministry that uh, walks alongside single women, homeless single women and their children. So uh, a couple of years back, we got caught wind that there were over 80 homeless children registered in the Sun Prairie School District. Wow. So we uh, got together with a bunch of people and kind of figured out what um, God wanted us to do to come alongside that program, that problem. Yeah, sounds like an excellent ministry to take up, absolutely. Yeah. So um, you got Praise in the Prairie. So what is exactly is Praise in the Prairie? So Praise in the Prairie is actually a fundraiser that we have every year. This is the third annual, and it's located in Sun Prairie at the fairgrounds in the um, Angel Park Speedway. So it's a music festival. Um, we're going to be having, actually it's a Friday and Saturday, June 3rd and 4th. Okay. And Michael Yankowski, he's going to be coming as our feature speaker on Friday night, and he'll be talking about his book, which is pretty exciting, uh, Under the Overpass. So, yeah, it's pretty exciting. And then Saturday we'll be having vendors and 10 different, I think it's 10 different bands that we have signed up. Oh, wow. Um, all kinds of fun things for the families to do. So we're pretty excited. Yeah, absolutely. As well, you should be. That sounds like a lot of fun. So if someone wanted to get involved, if I want to get involved, how do I sign up? What, how does someone go about doing that? Well, our website, um, sftsm.org, um, has all the information. We have a sign-up genius. Uh, we, need, we, have, we need over 200 volunteers to uh, pull that off. And so, um, you know, everything from helping with carnival games to selling brats, um, uh, we have different time slots. So we would love for people to just check out our website. We have um, all the all the vendors that are going to be there are on there. Um, we have the volunteer opportunities. We have the music lineup. Um, so it should be a really great day. Now you mentioned that 80, was it the homeless children in the, in the Sun Prairie School District? Mm -hmm. um, is that a number that's growing? Because that just kind of eats at your heart a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, this kind of homeless is, homelessness is a silent pr uh, problem. You don't see these kids on the street. You know, they're not on street corners. Um, a lot of them are staying in two-bedroom apartments with other families, or um, we get calls of, you know, them sleeping in their cars. So um, it's, it's a silent pr problem. And so part of Praise in the Prairie, one of our goals is to raise that awareness of homelessness. Um, so uh, the three goals for Praise in the Prairie is raising uh, awareness for homelessness, um, uh, uniting the community, and raising funds for our shelter. Okay. And now is, is the shelter open? Is it, is it going? Or is, is that something that you're raising funds to actually to, to start up and build? So we purchased a building in December. Oh, you did? Okay, and great. And we are uh, in the midst of completely renovating the inside, and we hope to be... Um, done in a couple months. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. So after that's done, you're going to have to come back and visit us again on that Absolutely. one, Absolutely. Right? Yeah. <laughs> we would love to come back and visit you. Yeah, yeah. I would, I would definitely like to know uh, a lot about it. So say I wanted to, you know, if, if not even sign up and pitch in and help out that way, what if I wanted to donate? What if I wanted to give a million dollars to your cause, okay, if I had a million dollars? Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, how, how would I do such a thing? You can go to our website, um, and there's a, a donate button, um, so you can do it right online. You can mail us a check to our PO box, and I think that's going to be listed. Um, so yeah, those two ways. Okay, terrific. Or bring uh, some money to Praise in the Prairie. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> a, a, absolutely. So Praise in the Prairie again, June third and fourth, uh, in Sun Prairie, over at uh, the Angel Park. That's like the Speedway and, and yeah, Fairgrounds. In the are Dream over there. Park, um, it's kind of the lower part of Angel Park. It's a dream. Okay, park. yeah, yeah, yeah. Know know exactly where that is. Um, I, I'm guessing too. I mean, besides Sun Prairie, this got to be like a problem. You know, just in general, in Dane County too, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, our, our dream and hope is to get this up and running here in Sun Prairie and then just take it to all these different communities that are struggling with the same thing. Ladies, it seems like a great cause. So again, I uh, hope your event goes off greatly. Thank June you. 3rd and 4th is coming up quickly, so go ahead and make your plans right now. So Angela Carey, thank you so much for joining thank us. You. Thank you. You bet. And thank you so much for joining us here on Talk of the Town. And we hope to see you next time right here on Channel 57. Bye-bye.